I am a digital sculptor, a digital character sculptor. I've been doing this for about 20 years. I've been working in the game. Uh, I've been working in games for 20 years. And I worked for Disney Interactive for 10 years. And the last, I'd say, five or six years, I was working on Disney Infinity, Toy Story 3, Cars 2, for the video game section of it. Um, and now I just teach online. I teach how to do uh, character modeling. And uh, I run a website called 3D Character Workshop. And uh, they invo invited me out to the Toy Fair today to give it a little demonstration inside of ZBrush. ZBrush is my favorite application for sculpting these characters. And uh, Pixelogic booth is right over here if you're interested in ZBrush and checking it out. Um, anyway, I was just going to show you some stuff, how I sculpt my characters in 3D. Um, I sculpted this guy earlier today over at the booth, and I thought since I only have I think 45 minutes or something like that. I was going to do kind of a cooking show style. <laughs> I show you how I do it in a very short amount of time. But usually a head like this would take me anywhere from two to three hours, something like that. Um, so yeah. Anyway, welcome. Thanks for hanging out. OK. I've got to figure out where this mouse goes. OK. So usually when I start out, I start out blocking out my characters with primitive shapes. Um, there's this old animator named Preston Blair. He used to work at, uh, at Disney and all the old Tom and Jerry cartoons and stuff like that. And he used to draw his characters with big, big primitive shapes. And it would help him because he would have to draw that character over and over and over again, and he would have to keep that character looking the same no matter what angle he had to draw him from, and that would really help. So towards the end of uh, Disney Infinity, I was thinking, man, I could probably do that in ZBrush and make it work. So I started blocking out characters. Turn this other stuff off. So I started blocking out characters in primitive shapes and then just pushing them around to make them kind of look. So this, all of these pieces, these are in separate pieces. And I'll just show you really quickly. I usually start with a sphere like this. Let me load up my interface. Hold on one second. So I also have a custom user interface for ZBrush. And I give that away for free on my website if you're interested. If you go to 3dcharacterworkshop.com, I give you this ruler file right here. It just helps you measure your characters going from uh, ZBrush to Maya or, or 3D Character or 3D Studio Max or Marvelous Designer and back again. Um, or it also helps you print your 3D characters in millimeters. So this ruler is like a 200 millimeter ruler, but you can also think about it as a two meter ruler inside of Maya. As long as your meters are set up in Maya, you can go back and forth really easy. Um, anyway, I usually start with a, a sphere like this, and then I will subdivide it up, and then delete that subdivision just so I can start with a, a little bit more geometry. Okay, sorry, let me load up. I was going to load up my, my user interface. Okay. Sometimes it doesn't want to go there. Almost there. Okay. Okay, so this is my user interface. I don't know if you can see that very well. It's kind of uh, kind of too light in here, but I have all these custom brushes along the bottom. If you can see that, and I've I've made all these brushes based on other brushes, and I've just tweaked a lot of things that I like because a lot of the brushes I felt like they were just too fast for me. I just wanted them to slow down because I work in very low resolution when I work. That's how I keep my surfaces nice and clean. Um, you guys want to see some Infinity uh, models first? Okay. Before I get started, I'll just show you a couple. All right, I brought some with me. So like Ant-Man or Loki or Boba Fett. Let me show you. Um, okay. I need to turn off the read only on these guys. So I'll open up Boba Fett. These are kind of big files. <laughs> I guess bigger than I thought they were. There we go. Okay. 
So, so this is Boba Fett. Um, can you guys see him okay? Sort of. <laughs> kind of hard to see. Um, what's interesting about Boba Fett is they, they actually had, when I say they, I mean LucasArts. They had some people from LucasArts come out and direct us on what version of what character they wanted us to work on. And um, the reason, it, he's kind of hard to see, but the reason he's blue is because they wanted an older version of him that actually didn't appear in the film. It appeared in an older toy. It was only manufactured in, you know, when Star Wars first came out. There's like one blue version, and they wanted that one again for some reason. Um, anyway, that's why he's blue and not beige. So this is one of them. Um, let's see. What would be a good one? Okay. So this is actually a figure that did not get uh, produced because she was done towards the end. This is Hera from Clone Wars. Um, this might be a big file too, I apologize. But she was she was interesting because she has um, these kind of tentacles that come off of her head and she had um, like some tattoos on those tentacles. And we had to figure out what kind of treatment we would do to those uh, patterns on her tentacles and that would show up in the toy when the toy was printed out. So we had a few different, uh, you guys see her? Okay. So this was a toy. Now, one of our first tries was we actually cut cut the patterns in like this, which, which sort of worked. Um, then we tried, you can see all these different versions. So we tried an embossed version, looks like that. So it was kind of extruded off the surface. And we tried just a painted version, which that's kind of my favorite. I just like painted, but it's hard to do in manufacturing. And then we had an embossed version, which is actually pressed in, which is uh, which was pretty good. The the extruded version works pretty well because then it allows um, the painters to hit it with a paintbrush, and it's a little easier that way. So, did you have a question? So, so usually um, in manufacturing, they would set up stamps. So it's a bit machine that would come down and stamp it. And when it's around a tentacle like that, it's hard to stamp. So it's got to be hand painted. And think of someone sitting there hand painting these, like a million of them. It just becomes, you know, <laughs> a little ludicrous. So and and uh, cost prohibit prohibitive. So it's better to uh, have those kind of patterns in the actual model, the physical model, and maybe even avoid the paint if, if they can do it. Uh, it's just more cost prohibitive, stuff like that, yeah. Especially if, you, or you can uh, manufacture them, if you can manufacture them in different colors, like if you could do an insert in there somehow that is a different color, and then this is wrapped around the outside, then it's, it's cheaper than having someone sit and paint it. Or if they can stamp it, that's better too. Like you'd stamp eyes and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay, so how I typically, uh, block these characters out like this, is I'll start with a sphere like this, and then I have these brushes, you can kind of see them across the bottom there. They're called insert multi-mesh brushes. And essentially all they are is just a bunch of primitives. So I typically use a sphere, and so this would act as his cranium, like his skull, the top of the skull, and then I would just click on the surface and drag it out. If you hold down shift, it'll snap. And then you can just kind of put it into place and then you find the pen. Where'd the pen go to this thing? I think somebody <laughs> walked out of the pen. Oh, here it is. It's in this wand thing. That's, that's new. <laughs> I feel like doing it like this. Okay. There we go. All right. So then I'll just, after I insert this sphere, then you can just get the move brush. I use the move brush, I would say, a good 90% of the time, most of the time, that's that's the brush I'm using, because I'm I'm literally dragging this stuff around and moving it into place. So I would essentially create the lower jaw, and I usually separate the two primitive objects right at the eye line, because it gives you a nice natural cut from the three-quarter view from the back. And you can hide the original sphere and just kind of get this into place. But I'll, I'll bring this across. So that, that cut line will actually define the top of the ear where the ear connects to the head. So
something like that. And then I'll just keep going, inserting new shapes and just kind of building it out that way. And I'll have my uh, concept here so I can turn it to the three quarter and just kind of view it and see how that's how that's working, pull this cheek out. Um, if you can get a good block out, that's like 80% of the work, 75% of the work, you get a really solid, solid looking block out. And then, then you just keep going. If you want to add ears, I usually just start with a sphere and just bring the ears in like this. And then with this gizmo, this is called a gizmo, you can just scale this down, insert it into the head, and then rotate it back. And then you go back to the move brush and just start start pushing things around. And it's, it's a lot like uh, traditional sculpting in a way. So I, I just kept doing this. And I put the neck in and the nose in and all that kind of stuff until I ended up with this. So this is after a lot of uh, move brush. <laughs> a lot of move brush, OK? Um, and then these, these eyelids. What I do is I insert the eyes, so the eyes are right here. Let's see, kind of pushed in. So um, I'll take those eyes, and then I'll cut them in half and make the eyelids out of them. So I'll just kind of clip them, put them in there. And then next, the th next thing I do is I'll stitch all that stuff together. So I'll use this thing called um, Remesh by Union. It's, it's fairly new to ZBrush. It's in, it was in, uh, I think it was in one of the last version 4R8s, uh, one of the patches. So I would just stitch it together. You can see all these little stitches along here. Are you guys familiar with ZBrush at all? You guys, yeah, somewhat, no? Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'll, I'm trying not to use the big terms and everything that's in ZBrush, but um, I usually stitch it together, and then I uh, essentially I use this thing called Z Remesher, which will redo the mesh to allow me to sculpt on it some more or, or manipulate it some more. And so the next step after that is is uh, I'll remesh it like this, and it will essentially rebuild that entire mesh. And then I can come in here, and I can actually put a mouth in there. And when I put the mouth in there, I'm just selecting those little uh, polygons. And pushing them into the face so it gives me it kind of gives me a, a mouth shape like this and then I can go in there and manipulate that mouth and I can close it if I want to um, then this right here it's pretty hard to see but you can use the pinch brush and just kind of come along here and you can pinch Hold on one second. I'm gonna set my hotkeys up There we go. Okay. So part of this user interface is I have this menu that will pop up, and I usually assign it to number two, and then I assign that menu to the back button on my pen. Then it will just pop up underneath wherever my pen is. And it gives me really fast access to all my tools, to speed up your production. So after I push the mouth cavity in, then I'll Z remesh it again. And then just start uh, just start manipulating that. So I'm really fast forwarding here, <laughs> but you can kind of see uh, it'll finally end up with a shape something like this. And this is when I close the mouth together. I do some inflating around here, around the lips, and I just keep moving stuff around until um, and I'm just looking at this concept and just getting it closer and closer and closer to what it looks like. And then I'm going to show you guys how to make, um, I added the mustache and the, the eyebrows and stuff like that. And I can show you how to do that really quick. So uh, ZBrush has this really cool thing that's called the topology brush that allows you to draw right on top of the surface. And you can make eyebrows and mustaches and things like that super duper easy. So I'm going to take this head and then grab the topology brush. Let's say I was making these eyebrows. Let me just hide them again. I'll just make them again. So if I zoom in here, and you just literally draw on the surface and draw this topology, and anywhere uh, you draw and make a square, it will make a, a quad. So if I go like this, you can see it made this 
this orange quad, but it's, it's not the shape I want, so I just need to add more lines in there. So if I add more lines like this, now I have a whole bunch of quads going down. And then if I hold down Alt and I drag on the surface, it'll clean up all the mess that I made. And it kind of has like a transparent eyebrow sitting there. And now if I want thickness, all I have to do is adjust my brush size to be whatever thickness I want those eyebrows to be. It's kind of that, that inner, inner ring that you can see. And if I click on the surface, it just adds the geometry. It just adds the thickness. So now you can see that it just made eyebrows just super fast. So if I was going to make, make those in another program like Maya or something like that, it, it might take a, a while to make those. Right? Um, but they're not the exact shape I want because it automatically does creasing along those edges. You can see it put this little crease right along there. It's just extra lines. And all it's doing is it's making uh, that geometry. It has subdivision, but it's also creasing those, those, those things. So basically what I do is I put it in a, in a new layer, which is called a subtool inside of uh, ZBrush. And when I, when I make these eyebrows, you can see everything else went dark, and that's a mask. It's masking everything else off, and the only thing left is the eyebrows unmasked. So now I can pull those apart into different layers. So what I'll do is I'll just hit, it's called split unmasked points. And if I hit that, it puts it into its own layer now. It's right over here, you can see. It's in its own layer on the right-hand side. And then I can uh, delete the creases. So if I hit uncrease all, now you can see the eyebrow is softer. It doesn't have those, those hard, crispy edges. Okay, and then I have wireframe turned on. Wireframe is just shift F. I can turn that on and off. And then I can just fill it with a color. So fill object with that color. Now I have those same eyebrows again. It just It's just super duper fast. So if you're in production, you're in prototyping, you just want to get this stuff out really quick, um, you, can, you can kind of build these things up pretty quickly. So um, I'm just going to show you guys how to do this uh, do this shirt down here. So if you wanted to, so this is this is about um, like an hour and a half of work so far is what I've what I've been doing. Uh, I'm going to delete these old eyebrows and unhide the ones that I made. But if I wanted to make this shirt down here, I'd essentially just do the same thing. But it's a little trickier because now you have a collar, so you can do it kind of one of two ways. You can draw the shirt on there without the collar, and then draw the collar on top over that. And then you just kind of fake fake the wrap, right? So you fake that it's wrapped over. But I kind of like having that wrap because it's more realistic and it's actually folding. So what I'll do is I'll make it like a shirt with the collar popped up. And then I'll then I'll just pull the collar down manually, the button, the, the vertices. So I'll show you how to I do that really quick. So same thing, I have the topology brush activated. I need to activate this head. And then, like I said, everywhere uh, this topology brush crosses and makes a quad, it's going to make a, uh, a face, they're called. Got to be careful. It's kind of hard to go down the center when you can't see it. Okay, and all you need to care about when you're using this brush is where the points are. So your, your lines don't have to be pretty. You just have to worry about where they cross. That's the only thing you have to worry about. And it's kind of better to have a small brush. You can see my brush size is about that big. If you have a big brush, it's kind of harder to make those points happen. Um, when you have a smaller brush, it makes the tick marks happen a lot more often. So when you cross, I'm kind of getting technical, sorry. but <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to kind of draw these circles around here. I'm going to make some big quads to start with, just like I did with the eyebrows, and then I'll cut them up. So it's just one big quad cutting the neck, right? And now what I can do is just draw a line splitting it down the center like this. Now there's two quads. And then I can split it again down the back and down the front. And then I can just start splitting it uh, this way. And what I'll usually do is I'll draw these lines all the way across, but I'll stop them in the middle. Because if I stop them on one of these green dots right here, um, it's hard to pick up that line to draw it again. So I stop kind of in the middle. And then I continue it on like that. You can see it's super fast. Now, one thing when I'm making a shirt or something like this, 
I don't want to add that thickness yet, like I did with the eyebrows, because it's too, it's too fast. It would be hard to manipulate something with both sides. So what I do is I just keep it a simple single plane, and then I manipulate that, and I add the thickness later. It's much easier to deal with. Okay, so, but on this one, this is going to be, if you think about his, uh, let me see if I can show you guys this way. So you can see his collar. See this green triangle I just drew? It's, this collar is split right here, right? So when I want to fold that collar down, I want it to split. So I'm going to actually make it split to begin with. I'm just going to draw a line, let's see, like that. Oh, it's creating a mess, okay. Got to go smaller with my brush. I'm trying to go right through that green circle. We'll see if it works. <laughs> and then make it quad. Yep, it worked. Okay, yay. Demos always scare me. <laughs> it's like, it's not working. Okay, and then uh, cross right there. Okay, so now if I hold down Alt and I drag on the surface, it'll clean up all the, the mess, just like I did with the eyebrow. Now, if I want to make this a single-sided mesh, I just need to change my draw size down to one. And then tap on the surface, and then it'll make a single-sided uh, surface. You can't see it because it's just, it's buried inside there. You can kind of see it sticking out the back there. But what I want to do is I want to split it into its own layer again, just like I did with the eyebrows. So I will just do a split on mass points again. And then if you hit your down arrow, it's going to go to whatever you just made. So you can see this, if I solo it, um, here is my shirt. And it automatically creases down the center, the center line right here. So I just want to kill those creases. So there we go. So this is, um, this is being dynamically subdivided is what it's called. It's, it's, it's adding more geometry actually in, in, in fourths. So it's subdividing it by four each time. So I can turn that off by hitting Shift D, saving the project here. Okay, so this is what my geometry actually looks like. If I hit D, it's going to uh, give me a temporary view of what it would look like if it was subdivided. It's kind of like hitting the number three in Maya, where you, where you actually kind of see a preview of it. So it's not really being subdivided. But now you can see this collar. So this is the part where I kind of cheat. And I'll make sure that my symmetry is turned on. And then I just, I, I'll just pull this collar down like this. Okay, hold on a second. But I want them, so you can see that the collar is folded, but then it splits at the tie right here. So it's not split higher up where the collar folds. So I'm actually gonna fold the collar at this, at this dot right here instead. So I'm gonna pull down this point, then this point and then pull this one up. It's going to be, it's going to be weird for a minute. It's going to get weird <laughs> until I pull all the points down to make it make sense. And when you, when you move points, you want to always adjust and you're going to be moving on the camera plane. So you want to adjust the camera to be the direction you want to move along. And then you move the points down like that. So I'm essentially just like, it's like taking a real collar and folding it down. And then the last point is like right here, pulling it down. And then we start to get our folded down collar and then we can just start adjusting that. And what I usually do is um, I use what's called a topological selection, which the move brush is right here. It's gonna affect both the points on both sides of the, the geometry there. So what I wanna do is I want to turn on topological because I only want to affect the point on the outside and not the one underneath. And I can change the range, which is kind of like the fall off. If you think about a spotlight where the, the, the main core of the spotlight is and then it has a fall off, you can adjust that fall off to, to essentially show how much of that you want to affect as it falls off. It's kind of hard to explain. But then you just kind of keep manipulating, keep pulling these points down. Until you kind of have, have what you want. But I like to work really, really low resolution. 
if this was like a really dense mesh, this would be difficult to do. So if I turn on dynamic subdivision now, you can kind of see what it's starting to look like. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll crease the, the edges because see these orange points? Yeah, it's, God, it's hard to see on that screen, sorry. But these orange points represent where the actual geometry is. And then when it gets subdivided, it kind of shrinks. So you want to, um, you want to crease those edges. And so what I'll do is I'll go down to this geometry menu and hit crease. I crease them. But it'll the, the default crease will just crease as almost everything because anything past 45 degree angle, it's going to throw a crease on there. So I need to turn this C tolerance way down. Sorry, up. I need to crank it up. There we go. So now it'll only put a little crease around the outside. So now when I hit um, subdivide, it's not going to shrink it as much. It's going to keep it. But you'll notice that it's making the collar points. There's not, they're not really points, they're round. And I can't really crease these points until I add thickness to that shirt. So before I do that though, I'm gonna unhide him and I wanna manipulate this shirt around it, around his neck so it actually uh, works. I don't know how much of this I can, I can get through in an hour. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> Learning accounting in an hour is <laughs> pretty crazy. I'm trying my best, you guys. And if you have any specific questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, I'm going to do a little, little Q&A at the end. Then I can uh, pull this shirt down. Anybody have questions? Just watching in a utter amazement. <laughs> All right, thanks. I also stream this um, this T-shirt I'm wearing is uh, ZBrush Live. I stream every single Monday at uh, I guess it's noon Pacific time. So if you guys want to watch me actually stream for more than an hour, you can you can come hang out there and ask questions. And I also do I teach this online. And I do uh, student-only live streams for two hours every single week. And I go much deeper. We talk about the game industry and what it's like to work in the game industry or the toy industry. I'm just going to pop this out a little more. So this tie is going to sit right on this point when I get it made. But I keep going back and forth between topological and not, just so I can kind of start to get this into shape. Okay. And I want this, I want this to sit right on his neck, but I also want to get it uh, add thickness first. So I think it's to the point where we can add thickness. So I can start manipulating that. So to add thickness, I usually do it one of two ways. There's this tool inside of ZBrush called Panel Loops. You can do it that way, and that'll add automatic thickness. But they also added this new tool called uh, ZModeler. It's not too new anymore, but they have it called ZModeler, and it, it kind of harkens back to the old box modeling days of old. <laughs> and you can just extrude a surface. So if you if you hover over a surface with this uh, brush active, the Z-Modeler Z brush active, it'll pull up this menu. And then you can say extrude, polygroup all. That's just meaning the color of the whole thing. I want to extrude the entire thing. And then I can just pull it out a bit. And that's going to add thickness. Now it looks like I'm having some uh, extrude issues back here. and We can fix them. I'm going to undo that and just kind of fix that before Trying to figure out where that's at, where that's giving me grief. Okay. So it's a little too close to the surface right here. So I'm just going to pull this out a little bit. Okay, let's do it again. Okay, that's better. Okay, so you can add thickness that way. Turn on uh, dynamic subdivisions. And now I can go back in there 
I just, uh, now that I have thickness, see how there's like a gap up underneath there? Now I can just go along and just push, push these so uh, it closes that gap up. Turn this off. Because now I know kind of where, where the thickness is and it kind of gives me a better idea of uh, what I need to move around. But this is this is essentially all I do with the, with the clothing when I'm doing characters. Sometimes it's difficult to grab onto the dots. But you can see how you can just kind of lay the collar down and you can split it more like this, put it further apart. And people are always surprised how low the geometry actually is because they see this, right? They see it after it's been subdivided and it looks really high resolution. Looks like he's got some kind of a tree cake going on. And what I can also do is I can run a crease around the top to make this, uh, this top look uh, tighter. So let me... So this, and I'm gonna. I can actually add in another uh, another edge loop too. If go back to the Z modeler and hover over one of these edges. It's set. It's already set to insert edge. Sorry, it's really hard to see. I keep saying that. Then I can put put this close, and then I can hover over this edge and hit transpose edge loop complete. Click on that, and what that's going to do is mask everything except for that edge. And I can center this gizmo in here, and then scale that bit out to make an actual kind of collar ledge. And then that's going to give me something that I can put a crease around. See that? So now I can come in here, and the, the uh, Z model of brush also has crease, so you can come in here and crease everything manually. So if I hit crease, Edge loop complete. I can tap on one, tap on the other one, hit dynamic subdivision, and now I have this kind of creased collar on there. Okay. So essentially during my live streams, this is kind of what I do. Um, I, but I build out a character, and you can ask me questions and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, like I said, it's on uh, twitch.com forward slash pixelogic. You can come and watch me there and ask questions. Also, there's a lot of ZBrush streamers on there. So, with from a lot of different disciplines. There's cosplayers on there that use ZBrush to make cosplay pieces for their armor. There are uh, people on there that do um, realistic sculpts and um, some, some more stylized stuff like I do. All sorts. Um, Eamon, the guy who did that dinosaur back there, that fungusaur, that big one you can see, he's giving a presentation, I believe, either tomorrow or Tuesday. Is it Tuesday? Okay, so Tuesday at 3 o'clock, he's going to be here giving a presentation. And uh, he's going to talk about how he made those fungusaurs. So you can still see these collars are rounded, right? So in order to make them sh nice and sharp, you just need to crease those edges. So these edges right here need to be creased. So if I get the Z modeler brush, just tap on that guy. Whoops. I don't want to crease the whole thing. I can just change this crease to edge, and it'll just crease one edge. And it's kind of easier to put the creases on those edges when it's in the low geometry state like this. So now when if I hit D, increase this middle one too up here. Right there. there we go, see that? So now it's a nice, crisp, tight collar. And we can get it even closer to the to matching, just pushing it down. Because in toy manufacturing, you want to have your model be watertight. You don't want to have any holes, any gaps. So you want to just push that stuff so it's laying right on the surface. Otherwise, resin will get caught up in those areas. Like, they'll, it'll pocket and pool. So you don't want to, you want to have it uh, sitting out like that. And uh, Form Labs is also right here. 
they have resin printers you can check out. Um, I did, uh, let's see, so I'm just kind of peeking down underneath here, seeing what the gaps are. You just keep closing those gaps up. So something like that. And then I push it against the skin of the guy, and or you can pull the skin out to touch and fill up all those areas so that it's watertight. Then what I'll do is I can take, uh, I usually save color until the very, very end. And you can, you can actually, um, just color grab off of, so this, this image is inside of ZBrush. It's in something called Spotlight. It's, uh, that's what this ring is right here. And you can load an image in here and you can delete the background out of that image. And then you can just have it floating here as a reference, which is super nice. Um, and you can eye drop colors off of it to fill your character with. But you have to have the Spotlight ring visible in order to do that. Otherwise it just picks the color from the background of the, of the scene. So you just hover over anything and just hit C, like the, like as in cat, just hit C to color it. And then you can hit fill object and it's gonna fill that object with whatever color you want. And then, so you can see that this, this shirt is still kind of, uh, kind of low resolution, right? It's not the, not the highest resolution thing ever. So what you can do now is, is hit apply on this dynamic subdivision. And that will make it, make it into real subdivision levels instead of uh, just temporary ones. And now I can just manipulate this even further. I'm going to take topological, turn it off. And I can just kind of push, because I want to get that slope. It's kind of sloping down his neck. And I'm not paying too much attention to his skin underneath right now, because I want to I want to hit that, that slope. So you just give yourself more geometry to work with. And then you can grab the, the actual skin, show the shirt, and just push the skin underneath it so it's not popping out like that. So now it looks like he has a, this, this thick pink collar. <laughs> And then you can just keep, you know, keep manipulating until you get it the shape that you want it to be. And it does take a long time. It's, it takes a lot longer than an hour to do this stuff. So I'm just trying to go, <laughs> trying to go fast. Anyway, you can kind of see how that works out, right? And then I would just take the skin and put it right to the edges of that shirt to fill in these gaps. So, so then when you go to 3D print it, um, it won't have any gaps underneath here. We, uh, when I was working on Disney Infinity, it was, we called it uh, filling it with bubble gum. So it's kind of like chewed up gum. You put it in all the empty spaces and just fill it up. Otherwise, you're gonna, it's going to uh, have manufacturing problems. So if it, you, you basically want it to, to stick out like this. And then you can use a, it's called a clip brush. This clip curve brush right here. And you can just run it along this edge. And it, what it does is it's gonna grab all that geometry and jam it all the way up to that line. And then see, it makes it nice and flat down here. And then you can just continue to push this geometry into the gaps just to fill it up. And you can run that clip brush as many times as you want, you know, to get it nice and flat. But now if you if you printed this out, yeah, pretend this was awesome right here. <laughs> it's not the best, but yeah, you can just you can just sit and work work that surface. So then it's just uh, then it's printable. You can make a base for it and print it out, It'll be nice and nice and tight. So on this shirt, I can subdivide it even more and make it cleaner. And I usually subdivide it up to about a million and each, each sub tool, each layer. So then it will take color well. So I usually save adding the color till the very, very, very end. I try and keep, uh, I try and like work with my surfaces and make them look good. 
and uh, keep the color or any surface detail till the very, very end. And grab the secondary color. And we can just grab this hard paintbrush. And we can just paint these lines on there really easily now. If, we, if it'll take the paint. ARGB. There we go. Ah, there we go. Okay. Okay. So I have this part of my uh, brush kit that you can get on 3dcharacterworkshop.com. It comes with this hard paint brush you can see right here. Uh, it also comes with an airbrush that's kind of a softer brush. And I use the airbrush to paint the red on his cheeks and his nose. And you can use this hard paintbrush to paint in uh, detailed lines like this. So you can just kind of just drag and just paint these lines down there. Something like that. And just kind of just go around and paint them on there. Now this this paint we used uh, we would send this like renders off to our, our painter to kind of go from, uh, and then they would try and match the paint color to our renders, and, and we could actually send them the actual colors that we use. Like we could do a, a Pantone color picker, send them those colors, and we would show them you know where the where the paints would actually go. So something like that, and then to make this. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much time we got left, but uh, to make something like this bow, it's exactly like I did the rest of it, where I just insert spheres. I'm going to duplicate this because you can't insert a sphere on a mesh that's been subdivided. So I have to duplicate it and then delete those subdivision levels. So I'm going to delete them. Now I can insert a multi mesh on there. So once I've drawn something, then I can uh, I can hide what it's like the uh, temporary geometry that I use. I can just delete the temporary geometry that I don't want. So you just hide it and hit delete hidden. And then you can just squish this down and push it in and rotate it into place, make it the size of that, that center of that bow. And then you just keep inserting uh, like another sphere. And squish it down. It, it's actually really fun once you start going, uh, just to kind of bring the shapes in. And like I said, the move brush is what I use 90% of the time. So you just go back to move the move brush. And this is saving the project, and I, it's saving the the other figures that I brought in. So <laughs> it might take a minute. Okay, so once I get something like this um, put in there, I can manipulate it with this gizmo here, get it into place, and then I just go pick that move brush and just kind of pull these into place. It's literally like you're just pulling a tie or something like that. And then again, I can go grab this color and just fill the object with it. And there you go. There's a tie. Um, then when I go to, if I do any surface detail, just like I did any color, um, I actually will wait until the very end, just like I do with paint. And uh, then I'll cut in those little, uh, those little cloth creases. So I can actually subdivide this a couple times. So it has enough geometry to hold the creases. And I want to mask off this little centerpiece because I don't want to put any creases in that centerpiece. So I can mask that, that piece off. And then I have this cloth brush. You can see at the bottom it's this cloth brush. And I'll usually just drag that, or the detail brush. I have a detail brush too. And I'll use one of those to just kind of cut the detail in. You know, just kind of like, whoop. Uh, for something like this, I, I'll typically turn off symmetry, so it's a little more interest, gives it more interest. Anyway, you can just do something like that, or you can grab the detail brush, cut them in. A little, little more subtle.
So it depends on how, how crispy you want your edges. You can also hide this centerpiece so you can go behind it. Yeah, something like that. That's better. Okay. Anyway, for the hair, I just do the same thing as I, as I did with the eyebrows. I would just draw it on and then extrude it and then make the hair. And same with the hat. I just insert a sphere and just mold it into place and do the creases and stuff like that. So I just keep continuing down the path just uh, until I'm, I'm done, <laughs> essentially. So if that, if that makes any sense. Just pull this shirt down. And I think I think we have internet on here. Let me see if we have. Sorry, I'll pull that back up in a sec. <laughs> I have to take a picture. Uh, no. Okay. So I was just going to show you some of my characters here. So this is some of the stuff I worked on. Um, I also did a skin for Overwatch, for Blizzard. I did the Zenyatta skin, the baseball skin. Um, this was a really fun piece for them. And I did most of this in ZBrush, uh, the, the cloth stuff. I did all the hard surface stuff using another, another program. Um, and then I did this one 100% in ZBrush during my live streams. And uh, Form Labs was kind enough to print this off. It was about about this tall. Uh, yeah, it just it turned out really great. Love love Form Labs. Um, and I, if you want uh, to watch me stream this, they archive them on their YouTube channel. Pixelogic does. So if you go to Shane Olson, uh, Pixelogic, you can find this stream, and you can watch me build build her just like I showed a little bit of today. And uh, I built this character for my online workshop. I walk you through exactly how to make this character. This is Kate Archer from an old game called No One Lives, no One Lives Forever. It's an old 90s game, I think. Um, I love that game. <laughs> I wish they'd make a new one. But uh, anyway, I, I teach you how to take it all the way to a game resolution. So here, this is a model viewer. I don't know how fast this internet is. So you can go to, to this art station page and load this up and spin her around and, and uh, look at her wireframe, like her topology. Uh, I teach you how to do this this game resolution topology inside my course, um, and I use uh, 3D Code and Marmoset to bake the maps and to do the retopology of the UVs. But I, I built her entirely inside of ZBrush, including that pistol. So I did. I use Z Modeler to build this pistol with. So um, let's see. And then you can see some of these other characters, like little Mickey. Um, the, the story for this one is they they sent down a, a crew of three ladies from from Disney just to approve this character. It's like the Mickey licensing department <laughs> came down and, and checked out and made sure he was good to go. So. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Uh, there's the crystal version of him. Uh, yeah, Tinkerbell. Uh, one of the fun ones was Spider-Man. So Spider-Man, um, I had to I had to cut in all the, the webbing detail because it's made it's a lot it's a lot cheaper. Like I said, it's a lot cheaper to actually cut in the detail than it is to try and pay someone to paint all that stuff in. So um, I. I did the pattern on the, the neutral pose Spider-Man, and then I posed it, and then it just wrecked some of those webbing, some of the webbing, and I had to go back in there and, and redo it. But uh, this, this one was, was a blast to work on. And then I do some personal stuff, like I'll just, I just make, make heads just for fun. This is an old one. I make a lot of heads during my live stream. Uh, and uh, yeah, like I made a lot. Of, it was fun. I did the snow texture using, there's a noise plugin inside of ZBrush. 
you can use. And I made it so the texture was heavy on the bottom in the shadowed areas, and then it was it's gone on the top, so it looks like it's lit kind of. That was something fun about him. And uh, there's a yeah, there's this video that kind of does this walkthrough of the whole process of uh, from concept to me sculpting it to printing it to then getting it painted and then getting it manufactured. Uh, you can find that on YouTube. I think it's just uh, Olaf Disney Infinity. You can find it there. So, anyway, does anybody have any questions at all? Say that one more. Oh, thanks. Oh, Sculptors Pro? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Sculptors Pro is interesting because it's, it's kind of dangerous. Um, I teach my students to stay out of the details for as long as absolutely possible. Um, and Sculptors Pro kind of begs you to go to the details as fast as you possibly can, which is dangerous because if you don't have your, your base forms and everything, and you just start going into details, your model's gonna look like crap. So you have to get your base forms, like block out your characters with primitives, like I showed first, and then after you get it all stitched together, and say you're running out of geometry, um, so sometimes I'll run out of geometry around the eyes or something like that. Then I'll flip on Sculptors Pro and add some of that geometry back in. Um, and then sometimes, uh, because Sculptors Pro, as good as it is, it'll still give you some triangulation, and the surface won't be as clean as it could be, with subdivision surfaces. And um, because you can't really uh, subdivide triangles, it just doesn't, they don't get along together. So then you're gonna end up Z remeshing it anyway and making quads out of it. So it's, it's really fun to play with. It's a fun uh, experimental toy to play with, but in the end, I always end up with a subdivided model. If that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh huh. I'm curious, like, your kind of cartoon style, but like, I see models of where like it'd be like a military character and like they like seamed in the coat. Like, uh huh. Like, how, how is the way to do that to kind of go and just kind of slowly just go around and just add like those kind of insects and kind of seam textures uh, or, or outfits or whatever you'd be doing for that kind of detail? Yeah, it kind of it kind of depends on how like what level of realism you're going for. Because with ZBrush, you can take it to any level you want, even, you know, ultra realistic. Uh, but when I'm doing stylized characters like this, I don't know if I have a good, a good representation of something like that. Um, oh, maybe I'm. Um, so essentially, what you do, well, I guess with with uh, with Zenyatta is the closest thing. So like these seams right here, those are those are all just cut in by hand to put in the surf in the surface. And I have, a, I have a brush that I made that does that specific thing. But it actually got replaced with this uh, chisel brush. Let me show you this chisel brush. You guys use that chisel brush yet? Um, let me show you. Use this pink head. I'm going to subdivide it up. So um, this chisel brush works with morph targets. So I, I did have a chisel brush that I had made that I used, but when when you would overlap a, a stroke, it would just garble up a mess when you cross the screens. So uh, what you do is you go make a morph target. So if you just go down to this, uh, what is it, morph target right here, and you after you subdivide it a couple times, you wait till the very, very end. Don't do this too early. Wait till the very, very end when it's like, okay, I'm ready to add the details or I'm ready to add the color. Then you subdivide it up, and then you add a morph target, so you store a morph target, and then you click on this chisel brush right here, and then it gives you all these cool different profiles, right? So there's this brush tip profile. I, I usually only use this first one. That's the one I used like for that pirate girl for um, and for the Zenyatta skin. I keep losing my pen. And then when you just when you draw on the surface, it just draws this really tight kick butt. Uh, think, let me subdivide it one more time. Hold on a second. I need more geometry. So usually when I subdivide something up, um, I'm looking for the density high enough that it's going to hold the detail, but not so high that it's going to uh, bog my machine down. Um, and, the, and usually that, that sweet spot 
is around two million per sub tool. Okay, so that's that's about the sweet spot. Um, you can go as high as like what? It's almost done. Okay, so uh, you can go to as high as like ten, but that's kind of the danger zone. Um, you just kind of stay around five or so. Then, so I just subdivided again, and then I added a new morph target. So we're about two million now. So now when I cut this in, now you can see that that beautiful sweet line. Um, it is very, it's it's really crispy on the edge. So you can go back in there and just kind of uh, smooth it back down, so it's not so crispy, and that will print gorgeous. Like on a little a little model, it'll just print beautifully. But I want to show you why I did a, a morph target. So there's two reasons. One of them is you can cross the streams without it causing problems. See that? That's just beautiful. So if you were to do that with an old brush, you'd be crying and you'd have to try and fix it. It would just ruin your day. So the other reason is because it lets you continue. So if you start a stroke, say you're going to make a, st a stroke that goes all the way around the back of the character, and you have to turn your character, then you can, you can start where you ended and keep going like this. And you can keep going again. It'll just kind of snap where you left off and kind of keep going. Sometimes it'll give you a little bit of a mess, but it's super easy to clean up, and, or you can just try it again. Um, but that's why that's why this new chisel brush is so nice because you can continue a stroke and you can cross over the top. So there's also uh, brushes out there that people have made. They're like stitch brushes, like Ryan Kingsley has a set where you can just run a stitch along the edge, and you can easily easily make your own, like with a with stitches with like little threads and stuff. Really easy to do. Um, like on that uh, on that Zenyatta baseball, I, I actually made a brush that would make those stitches that you can just draw it on there. And then what you can do, it's, it's kind of too late for me to show you right now, but you can actually uh, run those along a curve. So you can predefine a curve and then grab one of those brushes and tap on that curve and it'll just generate along that curve. And you can put that curve over around an open edge or between poly groups. If, you're, if you know what that kind of stuff is. So yeah, it's really, really powerful stuff. Yeah, so. All right, I think my time is up. Does anybody have any last minute questions? No, are we good? All right, thank you so much, guys. Thank you for coming. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Have a great day.